Part One of Story Nine of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The White Poodle, Part One. One. By narrow mountain paths from one villa to another, a small wandering troop made their way along the southern shore of the Crimea. Ahead commonly ran the white poodle, Arto, with his long red tongue hanging out from one side of his mouth. The poodle was shorn to look like a lion. At crossroads he would stop, wag his tail, and look back questioningly. He seemed to obtain some sort of sign, known to him alone, and without waiting for the troop to catch up, he would bound forward on the right track, shaking his shaggy ears, never making a mistake. Following the dog came the twelve-year-old Sergei, carrying under his left arm a little mattress for his acrobatic exercises, and holding in his right hand a narrow dirty cage, with a goldfinch taught to pull out from a case various coloured papers on which were printed predictions of coming fortune. Last of all came the oldest member of the troop, Grandfather Martin Lodishkin, with a barrel-organ on his bent back. The organ was an old one, very hoarse, and suffering from a cough. It had undergone, in the century of its existence, some scores of mendings. It played two things, a melancholy German waltz of Launer, and a gallop from A Trip to Chinatown, both in fashion thirty to forty years ago, but now forgotten by all. Beyond these drawbacks, it must be said that the organ had two false tubes, one of them, a treble, was absolutely mute, did not play, and therefore, when its turn came, the whole harmony would, as it were, stutter, go lame and stumble. The other tube, giving forth a bass note, had something the matter with the valve, which would not shut, and having once been played, it would not altogether stop, but rolled onward on the same bass note, deafening and confusing the other sounds, till suddenly, at its own caprice, it would stop. Grandfather himself acknowledged the deficiencies of his instrument, and might sometimes be heard to remark jocosely, though with a tinge of secret grief, "'What's to be done? An ancient organ! It has a cold! When you play it, the gentry take offence. Tfu! they say. What a wretched thing! And these pieces were very good in their time, and fashionable, but people nowadays by no means adore good music. Give them the geisha, under the double-headed eagle, please, or the waltz from the cellar of birds. Of course, these tubes... I took the organ to the shop, but they wouldn't undertake to mend it. It needs new tubes, said they, but, best of all, if you'll take our advice, sell the rusty thing to a museum, as a sort of curio. Well, well, that's enough. She's fed us till now, Sergey and me, and if God grant, she will go on feeding us. Grandfather Martin Lodishkin loved his organ, as it is only possible to love something living, near, something actually akin, if it may be so expressed. Having lived with his organ for many years of a trying vagabond life, he had at last come to see in it something inspired come to feel as if it were almost a conscious being. It would happen sometimes at night, when they were lying on the floor of some dirty inn, that the barrel organ, placed beside the old man's pillow, would suddenly give vent to a faint note, a sad melancholy quavering note, like an old man's sigh. And Lodishkin would put out his hand to its carved wooden side, and whisper caressingly, "'What is it, brother? Complaining, eh?' have patience friend and as much as lodishkin loved his organ and perhaps even a little more he loved the other two companions of his wanderings arto the poodle and little sergey he had hired the boy five years before from a bad character a widower cobbler promising to pay him two roubles a month shortly afterwards the cobbler had died and sergey remained with grandfather bound to him for ever by their common life and the little daily interests of the troop. 2. The path went along a high cliff over the sea, and wandered through the shade of ancient olive-trees. 
The sea gleamed between the trunks now and then, and seemed at times to stand like a calm and mighty wall on the horizon. Its color was the more blue, the more intense, because of the contrast seen through the trellis work of silver verdant leaves. In the grass, amongst the kizil shrubs, wild roses and vines, and even on the branches of the trees, swarmed the grasshoppers, and the air itself trembled from the monotonously sounding and unceasing murmur of their legs and wing cases. The day turned out to be a sultry one, there was no wind, and the hot earth burnt the soles of the feet. Sergei, going as usual ahead of grandfather, stopped, and waited for the old man to catch up to him. "'What is it, Serozha? asked the organ-grinder. "'The heat, grandfather Lodishkin. There's no bearing it. To bathe would be good.' The old man wiped his perspiring face with his sleeve, and hitched the organ to a more comfortable position on his back. "'What would be better?' he sighed, looking eagerly downward to the cool blueness of the sea. "'Only after bathing one gets more hungry, you know. A village doctor once said to me, "'Salt has more effect on man than anything else. That means it weakens him. Sea salt.' "'He lied, perhaps,' remarked Sergei doubtfully. "'Lied! What next? Why should he lie? A solid man, non-drinker, having a little house in Sevastopol. What's more, there's no getting down to the sea here. Wait a bit, we'll get to Mishkor, and there rinse our sinful bodies. It's fine to bathe before dinner, and afterwards to sleep, we three, and a splendid bit of work. Arto, hearing conversation behind him, turned and ran back, his soft blue eyes, half shut from the heat, looked up appealingly, and his hanging tongue trembled from quick breathing. "'What is it, brother doggy? Warm, eh?' asked Grandfather. The dog yawned, straining his jaws, and curling his tongue into a little tube, shook all his body, and whimpered. "'Yes, yes, little brother, but it can't be helped,' continued Lodishkin. "'It is written, in the sweat of thy face, though, as a matter of fact, it can hardly be said that you have a face, nor anything more than a muzzle. Be off! Go off with you! As for me, Serozha, I must confess I just like this heat. Only the organ's a bit of a nuisance, and if there were no work to do, I'd just lie down somewhere in the grass in the shade, and have a good morning of it. For old bones, this sunshine is the finest thing in the world. The footpath turned downward to a great highway, broad and hard and blindingly white. At the point where the troop stepped on to it commenced an ancient baronial estate, in the abundant verdure of which were beautiful villas, flower-beds, orangeries, and fountains. Lodishkin knew the district well, and called at each of the villas every year, one after another, during the vine-harvesting season, when the whole Crimea is filled with rich, fashionable, and pleasure-loving visitors. The bright magnificence of southern nature did not touch the old man, but it enraptured Sergei, who was there for the first time. The magnolias, with their hard and shiny leaves, shiny as if lacquered or varnished, with their large white blossoms, each almost as big as a dinner-plate, the summer houses of interwoven vines hanging with heavy clusters of fruit, the enormous century-old plane trees, with their bright trunks and mighty crowns, tobacco plantations, rivulets, waterfalls, and everywhere, in flower-beds, gardens, on the walls of the villas, bright sweet-scented roses. All these things impressed unceasingly the naive soul of the boy. He expressed his admiration of the scene, pulling the old man's sleeve, and crying out every minute, "'Grandfather Lodishkin! But, Grandfather, just look! Goldfish in the fountain! I swear, Grandfather, goldfish, if I die for it, cried the boy, pressing his face to a railing, and staring at a large tank in the middle of a garden. I say, grandfather, look at the peaches! Good gracious, what a lot there are! Look how many! And all on one tree! Leave go, leave go, little stupid! What are you stretching your mouth about? joked the old man. Just wait till we get to the town of Novorossiysk, 
and give ourselves to the south. Now that's a place indeed. There you'll see something. Sochi, Adler, Twapse, and then, little brother, Sukumbatum. Your eyes'll drop out of your head. Palms, for instance. Absolutely astonishing. The trunk's all shaggy like felt, and each leaf so large that we could hide ourselves in one. You don't mean it, cried Sergei joyfully. Wait a bit, and you'll see for yourself. Is there little of anything there? Now, oranges, for instance, or, let us say, lemons. You've seen them, no doubt, in the shops. Well? Well, you see them simply as if they were growing in the air, without anything, just on the tree, as up here you see an apple or a pear. And the people down there, little brother, are altogether out of the way. Turks, Persians, different sorts of Cherkesses, and all in gowns and with daggers, a desperate sort of people. And, little brother, there are even Ethiopians. I've seen them many times in Batum. Ethiopians, I know, those with horns, cried Sergei confidently. Well, horns, I suppose they have not, said Grandfather. That's nonsense. But they're black as a pair of boots, and shine even. Thick, red, ugly lips, great white eyes, and hair as curly as the back of a black sheep. Oh, oh, how terrible! Are Ethiopians like that? Well, well, don't be frightened. Of course, at first, before you're accustomed, it's alarming. But when you see that other people aren't afraid, you pick up courage. There's all sorts there, little brother. When we get there, you'll see. Only one thing is bad, the fever. All around lie marshes, rottenness. Then there is such terrible heat. The people who live there find it all right, but it's bad for newcomers. However, we've done enough tongue-wagging, you and I, Sergei, so just climb over that stile and go up to the house. There are some really fine people living there. If ever there's anything you want to know, just ask me. I know all. But the day turned out to be a very unsuccessful one for them. At one place the servants drove them away almost before they were seen, even from a distance by the mistress. At another the organ had hardly made its melancholy beginning in front of the balcony when they were waved away in disgust. At a third they were told that the master and mistress had not yet arrived. At two villas they were indeed paid for their show, but very little. Still, Grandfather never turned his nose up even at the smallest amounts. Coming out at the gate on to the road, he would smile good-naturedly and say, Two plus five, total seven. Hey, hey, brother Serozhenka, that's money. Seven times seven, and you've pretty well got a shilling, and that would be a good meal and a night's lodging in our pockets. And perhaps old man Lodishkin might be allowed a little glass on account of his weakness. Ay, ay, there's a sort of people I can't make out too stingy to give sixpence, yet ashamed to put in a penny. And so they surlily order you off. Better to give, were it only three farthings. I wouldn't take offence. I'm nobody. Why take offence? Generally speaking, Lodishkin was of a modest order, and even when he was hounded out of a place he would not complain. However, on this day of which we are writing, he was, as it happened, disturbed out of his usual equanimity by one of the people of these Crimean villas, a lady of a very kind appearance, the owner of a beautiful country house surrounded by a wonderful flower garden. She listened attentively to the music, watched Sergei's somersaults and Arto's tricks even more attentively, asked the little boy's age, what was his name, where he learned gymnastics, how grandfather had come by him, what his father had done for a living, and so on, and had then bidden them wait, and had gone indoors, apparently to fetch them something. Ten minutes passed, a quarter of an hour, and she did not appear, but the longer she stayed, the greater became the vague hopes of the troop. Grandfather even whispered to Sergei, shielding his mouth with his palm the while, "'Eh, Sergei, this is good, isn't it? Ask me if you want to know anything. Now we're going to get some old clothes, or perhaps a pair of boots. A sure thing!' At last the lady came out on her balcony again, and flung into Sergei's held-out hat 
a small silver coin, and then she went in again. The coin turned out to be an old worn-out threepenny bit with a hole in it. No use to buy anything with. Grandfather held it in his hand and considered it a long while distrustfully. He left the house and went back to the road, and all the while he still held the bit of money in his open and extended palm, as if weighing it as he went. "'Well, well, that's smart,' said he at last, stopping suddenly. "'I must say. And didn't we three blockheads do our best? It'd have been better if she'd given us a button. That, at least, we could have sewn on somewhere. What's the use of this bit of rubbish? The lady, no doubt, thought that it would be all the same as a good coin to me. I'd pass it off on someone at night. No, no, you're deeply mistaken, my lady. Old man Lodishkin is not going to descend so low. Yes, milady, there goes your precious three-penny bit. There. And with indignation and pride he flung the coin onto the road, and it gently jingled and was lost in the dust. So the morning passed, and the old man and the boy, having passed all the villas on the cliff, prepared to go down to the sea. There remained but one last estate on the way. This was on the left-hand side. The house itself was not visible, the wall being high, and over the wall loomed a fine array of dusty cypresses. Only through the wide cast-iron gate, whose fantastical design gave it the appearance of lace, was it possible to get a glimpse of the lovely lawn. Thence one peered upon fresh green grass, flower-beds, and in the background a winding pergola of vines. In the middle of the lawn stood a gardener watering the roses. He put a finger to the pipe in his hand, and caused the water in the fountain to leap in the sun, glittering in the myriads of little sparkles and flashes. Grandfather was going past, but looking through the gate he stopped in doubt. "'Wait a bit, Sergei,' said he. "'Surely there are no folk here. There's a strange thing. Often as I've come along this road I've never seen a soul here before. Oh, well, brother Sergei, get ready.' A notice was fixed on the wall. Friendship Villa. Trespassers will be prosecuted. And Sergei read this all aloud. Friendship? questioned Grandfather, who himself could not read. Vo, vo, that's one of the finest of words, friendship. All day we've failed, but this house will make up for it. I smell it with my nose, as if I were a hunting dog. Now, Arto, come here, old fellow. Walk up bravely, Sarozha. Keep your eye on me, and if you want to know anything, just ask me. I know all. 3. The paths were made of a well-rolled yellow gravel, crunching under the feet, and at the sides were borders of large rose-coloured shells. In the flower-beds, above a carpet of various-coloured grasses, grew rare plants with brilliant blossoms and sweet perfume crystal water rose and splashed continually from the fountains, and garlands of beautiful creeping plants hung downward from beautiful vases suspended in mid-air from wires stretched between the trees. On marble pillars, just outside the house, stood two splendid spheres of mirror-glass, and the wandering troop, coming up to them, saw themselves reflected feet upwards in an amusing, twisted and elongated picture. In front of the balcony was a wide, much-trampled platform. On this Sergei spread his little mattress, and Grandfather, having fixed the organ on its stick, prepared to turn the handle. But just as he was in the act of doing this, a most unexpected and strange sight suddenly attracted his attention. A boy of nine or ten rushed suddenly out of the house on to the terrace like a bomb, giving forth piercing shrieks. He was in a sailor-suit, with bare arms and legs. His fair curls hung in a tangle on his shoulders. Away he rushed, and after him came six people. Two women in aprons, a stout old lackey, without moustache or beard, but with grey side-whiskers, wearing a frock-coat, a lean, carroty-haired, red-nosed girl in a blue-checked dress a young sickly-looking but very beautiful lady in a blue dressing-jacket trimmed with lace, and, last of all, a stout, bald gentleman in a suit of two-sore silk, and with gold spectacles. 
they were all very excited, waving their arms, spoke loudly, and even jostled one another. You could see all at once that the cause of all their anxiety was the boy in the sailor suit, who had so suddenly rushed on to the terrace. And the boy, the cause of all this hurly-burly, did not cease screaming for one second, but threw himself down on his stomach, turned quickly over on to his back, and began to kick out with his legs on all sides. The little crowd of grown-ups fussed around him. The old lackey in the frock-coat pressed his hands to his starched shirt-front and begged and implored the boy to be quiet, his long side-whiskers trembling as he spoke. "'Little father, master, Nikolai Apollonovitch, do not vex your little mamma. Do get up, sir, be so good, so kind, take a little, sir. The mixture's sweet as sweet just syrup, sir. Now let me help you up.' The women in the aprons clapped their hands and chirped quickly, quickly in seemingly passionate and frightened voices. The red-nosed girl made tragic gestures, and cried out something evidently very touching, but completely incomprehensible, as it was in a foreign language. The gentleman, in the gold spectacles, made speeches to the boy in a reasoning bass voice, wagged his head to and fro as he spoke, and slowly waved his hands up and down. And the beautiful, delicate-looking lady moaned wearily, pressing a lace handkerchief to her eyes. Ah, Trilly, ah, God in heaven, angel mine, I beseech you, listen, your own mother begs you, now do, do take the medicine, take it and you'll see, you'll feel better at once, and the stomach ache will go away, and the headache. Now do it for me, my joy, oh, Trilly, if you want it, your mamma will go down on her knees. See, darling, I'm on my knees before you. If you wish it, I'll give you gold, a sovereign, two sovereigns, five sovereigns. Truly, would you like a live ass? Would you like a live horse? Oh, for goodness sake, say something to him, doctor. Pay attention, Truly. Be a man, droned the stout gentleman in the spectacles. ay 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 yelled the boy, squirming on the ground, and kicking about desperately with his feet. Despite his extreme agitation, he managed to give several kicks to the people around him, and they, for their part, got out of his way sufficiently cleverly. Sergei looked upon the scene with curiosity and astonishment, and at last nudged the old man in the side, and said, "'Grandfather Lodishkin, what's the matter with him? Can't they give him a beating?' "'A beating? I like that. That sort isn't beaten, but beats everybody else.' A crazy boy, ill, I expect. Insane? inquired Sergei. How should I know? Tss, be quiet. Ay, ay, ah, scum, fatheads! shouted the boy, louder and louder. Well, begin, Sergei. Now's the time, for I know, ordered Ludishkin suddenly, taking hold of the handle of his organ and turning it with resolution. The snuffling and false notes of the ancient gallop rose in the garden. All the people stopped suddenly and looked round. Even the boy became silent for a few seconds. "'Ah, God in heaven, they will upset my poor Trilly still more!' cried the lady in the blue dressing-jacket, with tears in her eyes. "'Chase them off quickly, quickly! Drive them away, and the dirty dog with them! Dogs have always such dreadful diseases! Why do you stand there helpless, Ivan, as if you were turned to stone?" She shook her handkerchief wearily in the direction of grandfather and the little boy. The lean, red-nosed girl made dreadful eyes. Someone gave a threatening whisper. The lackey in the dress-coat ran swiftly from the balcony on his tiptoes, and, with an expression of horror on his face, cried to the organ-grinder, spreading out his arms like wings as he spoke. Whatever does it mean? Who permitted them? Who let them through? March! Clear out! The organ became silent in a melancholy whimper. Fine, gentlemen, allow us to explain, began the old man delicately. No explanations whatever. March! roared the lackey in a hoarse, angry whisper. His whole fat face turned purple, 
and his eyes protruded to such a degree that they looked as if they would suddenly roll out and run away like wheels. The sight was so dreadful that Grandfather involuntarily took two steps backward. "'Put the things up, Sergei,' said he, hurriedly jolting the organ on to his back. "'Come on!' But they had not succeeded in taking more than ten steps when the child began to shriek even worse than ever. "'Ay, ya, ya! Give it me! I want it! Ay, give it! Call them back! Me!' "'But Trilly! Ah, God in heaven, Trilly! Ah, call them back!' moaned the nervous lady. Tfu! How stupid you all are! Ivan, don't you hear when you're told? Go at once and call those beggars back!' "'Certainly! You! Hey! What do you call yourselves? Organ grinders! Come back!' cried several voices at once. The stout lackey jumped across the lawn, his side-whiskers waving in the wind, and, overtaking the artistes, cried out, "'Psst! Musicians! Back! Don't you hear, friends? You're called back!' cried he, panting and waving both arms. "'Venerable old man,' said he at last, catching hold of grandfather's coat by the sleeve, turn the shafts round the master and mistress will be pleased to see your pantomime well well business at last sighed grandfather turning his head round and the little party went back to the balcony where the people were collected and the old man fixed up his organ on the stick and played the hideous gallop from the very point at which it had been interrupted the rumpus had died down the lady with her little boy and the gentleman in the gold spectacles came forward the others remained respectfully behind out of the depths of the shrubbery came the gardener in his apron and stood at a little distance from somewhere or other the yard porter made his appearance and stood behind the gardener he was an immense bearded peasant with a gloomy face narrow brows and pockmarked cheeks he was clad in a new rose-coloured blouse, on which was a pattern of large black spots. Under cover of the hoarse music of the gallop, Sergei spread his little mattress, pulled off his canvas breeches they had been cut out of an old sack, and behind, at the broadest part, were ornamented by a quadrilateral trademark of a factory, threw from his body his torn shirt, and stood erect in his cotton underclothes. In spite of the many mends of these garments, he was a pretty figure of a boy, lithe and strong. He had a little programme of acrobatic tricks which he had learnt by watching his elders in the arena of the circus. Running to the mattress, he would put both hands to his lips, and, with a passionate gesture, wave two theatrical kisses to the audience. So his performance began. Grandfather turned the handle of the organ without ceasing and while the boy juggled various objects in the air, the old music machine gave forth its trembling, coughing tunes. Sergei's repertoire was not a large one, but he did it well and with enthusiasm. He threw up into the air an empty beer-bottle, so that it revolved several times in its flight, and, suddenly catching it neck downward on the edge of a tray, he balanced it there for several seconds. He juggled four balls and two candles, catching the latter simultaneously in two candlesticks. He played with a fan, a wooden cigar and an umbrella, throwing them to and fro in the air, and at last, having the open umbrella in his hand, shielding his head, the cigar in his mouth, and the fan coquettishly waving in his other hand. Then he turned several somersaults on the mattress, did the frog, tied himself into an American knot, walked on his hands, and, having exhausted his little programme, sent once more two kisses to the public, and, panting from the exercise, ran to Grandfather to take his place at the organ. Now was Arto's turn. This the dog perfectly well knew, and he had for some time been prancing round in excitement and barking nervously. Perhaps the clever poodle wished to say that, in his opinion, it was unreasonable to go through acrobatic performances when Ray Amour showed thirty-two degrees in the shade. But Grandfather Lodishkin, with a cunning grin, pulled out of his coat-tail pocket a slender kizil switch. Arto's eyes took a melancholy expression. "'Didn't I know it?' they seemed to say and he lazily and insubmissively raised himself on his hind paws, 
never once ceasing to look at his master and blink. "'Sir, Varto, so, so, so,' ordered the old man, holding the switch over the poodle's head. "'Over, so, turn, again, again, dance, doggy, dance, sit, what, don't want to, sit when you're told, ah, that's right. "'Now look, salute the respected public, now, Arto,' cried Lodishkin threateningly. Baff barked the dog in disgust. Then he followed his master mournfully with his eyes, and added twice more, Garf, garf! No, my old man doesn't understand me, this discontented barking seemed to say. That's it, that's better, politeness before everything. Now we'll have a little jump, continued the old man, holding out the twig at a short distance above the ground. Allez! There's nothing to hang out your tongue about, brother. Allez! Gop! Splendid! And now, please, noch einmal, allez, gop, allez, gop, wonderful doggy. When you get home you shall have carrots. You don't like carrots, eh? Ah, I'd completely forgotten. Then take my silk topper and ask the folk. Perhaps they'll give you something a little more tasty. Grandfather raised the dog on his hind legs and put in his mouth the old greasy cap, which, with such delicate irony, he had named a silk topper. Arto, standing affectedly on his grey hind legs, and holding the cap in his teeth, came up to the terrace. In the hands of the delicate lady there appeared a small mother-of-pearl purse. All those around her smiled sympathetically. "'What? Didn't I tell you?' asked the old man of Sergei, teasingly. "'Ask me if you ever want to know anything, brother, for I know nothing less than a rouble. At that moment there broke out such an inhuman yowl that Arto involuntarily dropped the cap and leaped off with his tail between his legs, looking over his shoulders fearfully, and came and lay down at his master's feet. "'I want him!' cried the curly-headed boy, stamping his feet. "'Give him to me! I want him! The dog, I tell you! Treely wants the dog!' Ah, God in heaven! Ah, Nikolai Apollonovitch! Little father, master, be calm, Trilly, I beseech you! cried the voices of the people. The dog! Give me the dog! I want him! Scum! Demons! Fatheads! cried the boy, fairly out of his mind. But, angel mine, don't upset your nerves! lisped the lady in the blue dressing jacket. You'd like to stroke the doggy? Very well, very well, my joy. In a minute you shall. Doctor, what do you think? Might Trilly stroke this dog? Generally speaking, I should not advise it, said the doctor, waving his hands. But if we had some reliable disinfectant, as, for instance, boracic acid or a weak solution of carbolic, then generally... The dog! In a minute, my charmer, in a minute. So, doctor... You order that we wash the dog with boracic acid, and then? Oh, Trilly, don't get into such a state. Old man, bring up your dog, will you, if you please? Don't be afraid. You will be paid for it. And, listen a moment, is the dog ill? I wish to ask, is the dog suffering from hydrophobia or skin disease? Don't want to stroke him. Don't want to, roared Trilly, blowing out his mouth like a bladder. Fatheads, demons! Give it to me altogether. I want to play with it, for always. Listen, old man, come here, cried the lady, trying to outshout the child. Ah, Trilly, you'll kill your own mother if you make such a noise. Why ever did they let these music people in? Come nearer, nearer still. Come when you're told. That's better. Oh, don't take offence. Trilly, your mother will do all that you ask. I beseech you, miss, do try and calm the child. Doctor, I pray you. How much do you want, old man? Grandfather removed his cap, and his face took on a respectfully piteous expression. As much as your kindness will think fit, my lady, your excellency, we are people in a small way, and anything is a blessing for us. Probably you will not do anything to offend an old man. Ah, how senseless! Trilly, don't make your little throat ache. Don't you grasp the fact that the dog is yours and not mine? Now, how much do you say? 
Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Ah, I want it. Give me the dog, give me the dog, squealed the boy, kicking the round stomach of the lackey who happened to be near. Th that is, forgive me, your serenity, stuttered Ladishkin. You see, I'm an old man, stupid. It's difficult to understand at once. What's more, I'm a bit deaf. So I ought to ask, in short, what were you wishing to say? For the dog? Ah, God in heaven, it seems to me you're playing the idiot on purpose, said the lady, boiling over. Nurse, give Trilly some water at once. I ask you, in the Russian language, for how much do you wish to sell your dog? Do you understand? Your dog! Dog! The dog! The dog! cried the boy, louder than ever. Ludishkin took offence, and put his hat on again. "'Dogs, my lady, I do not sell,' said he coldly and with dignity. "'And what is more, madam, this dog, it ought to be understood, has been for us too,' he pointed with his middle finger over his shoulder at Sergei, "'has been for us too, feeder and clother. It has fed us, given us drink, and clothed us. I could not think of anything more impossible than, for example, that we should sell it. Trilly all the while was giving forth piercing shrieks like the whistle of a steam engine. They gave him a glass of water, but he splashed it furiously all over the face of his governess. Listen, you crazy old man, there are no things which are not for sale, if only a large enough price be offered, insisted the lady, pressing her palms to her temples. Miss, wipe your face quickly and give me my headache mixture. Now, perhaps your dog costs a hundred roubles. What then? Two hundred? Three hundred? Now answer, image. Doctor, for the love of the Lord, do say something to him. Pack up, Sergei, growled Lodishkin morosely. Image, image. Here, Arto. Hey, wait a minute, if you please drawled the stout gentleman in the gold spectacles in an authoritative bass. You'd better not be obstinate, dear man. Now I'm telling you. For your dog, ten roubles would be a beautiful price, and even for you into the bargain. Just consider, ass, how much the lady is offering you. I most humbly thank you, sir, mumbled Rodishkin, hitching his organ onto his shoulders. Only I can't see how such a piece of business could ever be done as, for instance, to sell. Now I should think you'd better seek some other dog somewhere else. So good day to you. Now, Sergei, go ahead. And have you got a passport? roared the doctor in a rage. I know you, Canale. Porter, Semyon, drive them out, cried the lady, her face distorted with rage. The gloomy-looking porter in the rose-coloured blouse rushed threateningly towards the artistes. A great hubbub arose on the terrace. Trilly, roaring for all he was worth, his mother sobbing, the nurse chattering volubly to her assistant, the doctor booming like an angry cockchafer. But Grandfather and Sergei had no time to look back or to see how all would end. The poodle running in front of them, they got quickly to the gates, and after them came the yard-porter, punching the old man in the back, beating on his organ, and crying out, "'Out you get, you rascals! Thank God you're not hanging by your neck, you old scoundrel! Remember, next time you come here, we shan't stand on ceremony with you, but lug you at once to the police station! Charlatans!' For a long time the boy and the old man walked along silently together, but suddenly, as if they had arranged the time beforehand, they both looked at one another and laughed. Sergei simply burst into laughter, and then Lodishkin smiled, seemingly in some confusion. "'Eh, hey, Grandfather Lodishkin, you know everything?' teased Sergei. "'Yes, brother, we've been nicely fooled, haven't we?' said the old organ-grinder, nodding his head. "'A nasty bit of a boy, however. How they'll bring up such a creature the Lord only knows. Yes, if you please, Twenty-five men and women standing around him, dancing dances for his sake. Well, if he'd been in my power, I'd have taught him a lesson. Give me the dog, says he. What then? If he asks for the moon out of the sky, give him that also, I suppose. Come here, Arto, come here, my little doggy-doggy. 
well and what money we've taken to-day astonishing better than money continued sergey one lady gave us clothes another a whole rouble and doesn't grandfather lodishka know everything in advance you be quiet growled the old man good-naturedly don't you remember how you ran from the porter i thought i should never catch you up a serious man that porter leaving the villas the wandering troop stepped downward by a steep and winding path to the sea at this point the mountains retiring from the shore left a beautiful level beach covered with tiny pebbles which lisped and chattered as the waves turned them over two hundred yards out to sea dolphins turning somersaults showing for moments their curved and glimmering backs away on the horizon of the wide blue sea standing as it were on a lovely velvet ribbon of dark purple were the sails of fishing boats tinted to a rose colour by the sunlight here we shall bathe grandfather lodishkin said sergey decisively and he took off his trousers as he walked jumping from one leg to the other to do so let me help you to take off the organ he swiftly undressed smacking his sunburnt body with the palms of his hands ran down to the waves took a handful of foam to throw over his shoulders and jumped into the sea grandfather undressed without hurry shielding his eyes from the sun with his hands and wrinkling his brows he looked at sergey and grinned knowingly he's not bad the boy is growing thought ladishkin to himself plenty of bones all his ribs showing but all the same he'll be a strong fellow hey saroshka don't you get going too far a sea pig'll drag you off if so i'll catch it by the tail cried sergey from a distance grandfather stood a long time in the sunshine feeling himself under his armpits he went down to the water very cautiously and before going right in carefully wetted his bald red crown and the sunken sides of his body he was yellow wizened and feeble his feet were astonishingly thin, and his back, with sharp protruding shoulder-blades, was humped by the long carrying of the organ. "'Look, Grandfather Lodishkin!' cried Sergey, and he turned a somersault in the water. Grandfather, who had now gone into the water up to his middle, sat down with a murmur of pleasure, and cried out to Sergey, "'Now don't you play about, piggy! Mind what I tell you, or I'll give it to you!' Arto barked unceasingly, and jumped about the shore. He was very much upset to see the boy swimming out so far. "'What's the use of showing off one's bravery?' worried the poodle. "'Isn't there the earth, and isn't that good enough to go on, and much calmer?' He went into the water two or three times himself, and lapped the waves with his tongue. But he didn't like the salt water, and was afraid of the little waves rolling over the pebbles towards him. He jumped back to dry sand, and at once set himself to bark at Sergey. "'Why these silly, silly tricks? Why not come and sit down on the beach by the side of the old man? Dear, dear, what a lot of anxiety that boy does give us!' "'Hey, Sarozha, time to come out, anyway. You've had enough!' cried the old man. "'In a minute, Grandfather Lodishkin,' the boy cried back. "'Just look how I do the steamboat!' Oh, at last he swam into the shore but before dressing he caught arto in his arms and returning with him to the water's edge flung him as far as he could the dog at once swam back leaving above the surface of the water his nostrils and floating ears alone and snorting loudly and offendedly reaching dry sand he shook his whole body violently and clouds of water flew on the old man and on sergey sirozha boy look surely that's for us said ladishkin suddenly staring upwards towards the cliff along the downward path they saw that same gloomy-looking yard porter in the rose-coloured blouse with the speckled pattern waving his arms and crying out to them though they could not make out what he was saying the same fellow who a quarter of an hour ago had driven the vagabond troop from the villa. "'What does he want?' asked Grandfather, mistrustfully. End of Part 1
Part two of Story Nine of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The White Poodle. Part two. Four. The porter continued to cry, and at the same time to leap awkwardly down the steep path, the sleeves of his blouse trembling in the wind, and the body of it blown out like a sail. Oh, ho, ho! Wait, you three! There's no finishing with these people, growled Lodishkin angrily. It's Artoshka they're after again. Grandfather, what do you say? Let's pitch into him, proposed Sergey bravely. You be quiet. Don't be rash. But what sort of people can they be? God forgive us! I say, this is what you've got to do, began the panting porter from afar. You'll sell that dog, eh, what? There's no peace with the little master. Roars like a calf. Give me, give me the dog. The mistress has sent. Buy it, says she, however much you have to pay. Now that's pretty stupid on your mistress's part, cried Lodishkin angrily, for he felt considerably more sure of himself here on the shore than he did in somebody else's garden. And I should like to ask, how can she be my mistress? She's your mistress, perhaps, but to me further off than a third cousin, and I can spit at her if I want to. And now, please, for the love of God, I pray you, be so good as to go away, and leave us alone." But the porter paid no attention. He sat down on the pebbles beside the old man, and, awkwardly scratching the back of his neck with his fingers, addressed him thus. "'Now, don't you grasp, fool!' "'I hear it from a fool,' interrupted the old man. "'Now come, that's not the point. Just put it to yourself. What's the dog to you? Choose another puppy. All your expense is a stick, and there you have your dog again. Isn't that sense? Don't I speak the truth? Eh?' Grandfather meditatively fastened the strap which served him as a belt. To the obstinate questions of the porter he replied with studied indifference. Talk on, say all you've got to say, and then I'll answer you at once. Then, brother, think of the number, cried the porter hotly. Two hundred, perhaps three hundred roubles in a lump. Well, they generally give me something for my work, but just you think of it. Three whole hundred. Why, you know, you could open a grocer's shop with that. While saying this, the porter plucked from his pocket a piece of sausage and threw it to the poodle. Arto caught it in the air, swallowed it at a gulp, and ingratiatingly wagged his tail. "'Finished?' asked Ladishkin sweetly. "'Doesn't take long to say what I had to say. Give the dog, and the money will be in your hands.' "'So,' drawled Grandfather mockingly, "'that means the sale of the dog, I suppose?' "'What else? Just an ordinary sale. You see, our little master is so crazy. That's what's the matter.' Whatever he wants, he turns the whole house upside down. Give, says he, and it has to be given. That's how it is without his father. When his father's here, holy saints, we all walk on our heads. The father is an engineer. Perhaps you've heard of Mr. Obolyaninov? He builds railway lines all over Russia. A millionaire. They've only one boy, and they spoil him. I want a live pony, says he. Here's a pony for you. I want a boat, says he. Here's a real boat. There is nothing that they refuse him. And the moon? That is, in what sense? asked the porter. I say, has he never asked for the moon from the sky? The moon! What nonsense is that? said the porter, turning red. But come now, we're agreed, aren't we, dear man? By this time Grandfather had succeeded in putting on his old green-seamed jacket and he drew himself up as straight as his bent back would permit. "'I'll ask you one thing, young man,' said he, not without dignity. "'If you had a brother, or, let us say, a friend, that had grown up with you from childhood, now stop, friend, don't throw sausage to the dog, better eat it yourself. You can't bribe the dog with that, brother, I say, if you had a friend, the best and truest friend that it's possible to have, one who from childhood, well then, for example, for how much would you sell him? I'd find a price even for him. 
Oh, you'd find a price. Then go and tell your master who builds the railroads, cried grandfather in a loud voice. Go and tell him that not everything that ordinarily is for sale is also to be bought. Yes, and you'd better not stroke the dog. That's to no purpose. Here, Arto, dog, I'll give it to you. Come on, Sergey. Oh, you old fool, cried the porter at last. Fool, yes, I was one from birth, but you, bit of rabble, Judas, soul-seller, shouted Lodishkin, when you see your lady general, give her our kind respects, our deepest respects. Sergey, roll up the mattress. Ay, ay, my back, how it aches. Come on. So that's what it means, drawled the porter significantly. Yes, that's what it is. Take it answered the old man exasperatingly. The troop then wandered off along the shore, following on the same road. Once, looking back accidentally, Sergey noticed that the porter was following them. His face seemed cogitative and gloomy, his cap was over his eyes, and he scratched with five fingers his shaggy, carroty-haired neck. 5. A certain spot between Mishkor and Alupka had long since been put down by Lodishkin as a splendid place for having lunch, and it was to this that they journeyed now. Not far from a bridge over a rushing mountain torrent there wandered from the cliff-side a cold chattering stream of limpid water. This was in the shade of crooked oak trees and thick hazel bushes. The stream had made itself a shallow basin in the earth, and from this overflowed in tiny snake-like streamlets glittering in the grass like silver every morning and evening one might see here pious turks making their ablutions and saying their prayers our sins are heavy and our provisions are meagre said grandfather sitting in the shade of a hazel bush now Sarozha, come along lord give thy blessing he pulled out from a sack some bread, some tomatoes, a lump of Bessarabian cheese, and a bottle of olive oil. He brought out a little bag of salt, an old rag tied round with string. Before eating, the old man crossed himself many times and whispered something. Then he broke the crust of bread into three unequal parts. The largest he gave to Sergei. He is growing, he must eat. The next largest he gave to the poodle, and the smallest he took for himself. In the name of the Father and the Son, the eyes of all wait upon thee, O Lord, whispered he, making a salad of the tomatoes. Eat, Sarozha. They ate slowly, not hurrying, in silence, as people eat who work. All that was audible was the working of three pairs of jaws. Arto, stretched on his stomach, ate his little bit at one side, gnawing the crust of bread, which he held between his front paws. Grandfather and Sergey alternately dipped their tomatoes in the salt, and made their lips and hands red with the juice. When they had finished, they drank water from the stream, filling a little tin can and putting it to their mouths. It was fine water, and so cold that the mug went cloudy on the outside from the moisture condensing on it. The midday heat and the long road had tired the performers, for they had been up with the sun. Grandfather's eyes closed involuntarily. Sergey yawned and stretched himself. "'Well, now, little brother, what if we were to lie down and sleep for a minute or so?' asked Grandfather. "'One last drink of water.' "'Ugh! Fine!' cried he, taking his lips from the can and breathing heavily, the bright drops of water running from his beard and whiskers. "'If I were Tsar I'd drink that water every day, from morning to night.' here arto well god has fed us and nobody has seen us or if anybody has seen us he hasn't taken offence och 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 unush, ki, ee. the old man and the boy lay down side by side in the grass making pillows for their heads of their jackets the dark leaves of the rugged many branching oaks murmured above them occasionally through the shade gleamed patches of bright blue sky the little streams running from stone to stone chattered monotonously and stealthily as if they were putting someone to sleep by sorcery. Grandfather turned from side to side, muttered something to Sergey, but to Sergey his voice seemed far away in a soft and sleepy distance, and the words were strange, as those spoken in a fairy tale. 
first of all i buy you a costume rose and gold slippers also of rose-coloured satin in kiev or kharkov or perhaps let us say in the town of odessa there brother there are circuses if you like endless lanterns all electricity people perhaps five thousand perhaps more how should i know we should have to make up a name for you an italian name of course what can one do with a name like estifeyev or let us say ludishkin quite absurd no imagination in them whatever so we'd let you go on the placards as antonio or perhaps also quite good enrico or alphonse the boy heard no more a sweet and gentle slumber settled down upon him and took possession of his body and grandfather fell asleep losing suddenly the thread of his favourite after-dinner thoughts his dream of sergey's magnificent acrobatic future once however in his dream it appeared to him that arto was growling at somebody for a moment through his dreamy brain there passed the half-conscious and alarming remembrance of the porter in the rose-coloured blouse but overcome with sleep tiredness and heat he could not get up but only idly with closed eyes cried out to the dog arto where are you going i'll give it you gypsy but at once he forgot what he was talking about and his mind fell back into the heaviness of sleep and vague dreams at last the voice of sergey woke him up for the boy was running to and fro just beyond the stream shouting loudly and whistling calling anxiously for the dog here arto come back phew phew come back arto what are you howling about sergey cried ladishkin in a tone of displeasure trying to bring the circulation back to a sleeping arm we've lost the dog while we slept that's what we've done answered the boy in a harsh scolding note the dog's lost he whistled again sharply and cried Artu! ah you're just making up nonsense he'll return said grandfather but all the same he also got up and began to call the dog in an angry sleepy old man's falsetto arto here dog the old man hurriedly and tremblingly ran across the bridge and began to go upward along the highway calling the dog as he went in front of him lay the bright white stripe of the road level and clear for half a mile but on it not a figure not a shadow arto artoshenka wailed the old man in a piteous voice but suddenly he stopped calling him bent down on the roadside and sat on his heels yes that's what it is said the old man in a failing voice sergey sarozha come here my boy now what do you want cried the boy rudely what have you found now found yesterday lying by the roadside eh sarozha what is it what do you make of it do you see what it is asked the old man scarcely above a whisper he looked at the boy in a piteous and distracted way and his arms hung helplessly at his sides in the dust of the road lay a comparatively large half-eaten lump of sausage and about it in all directions were printed a dog's paw marks he's drawn it off the scoundrel lured it away whispered grandfather in a frightened shiver still sitting on his heels it's he no one else it's quite clear don't you remember how he threw the sausage to arto down by the sea yes it's quite clear repeated sergey sulkily grandfather's wide-open eyes filled with tears quickly overflowing down his cheeks he hid them with his hands now what can we do serozhenka eh boy what can we do now asked the old man rocking to and fro and weeping helplessly what to do what to do teased sergey get up grandfather lodishkin let's be going yes let us go repeated the old man sadly and humbly raising himself from the ground we'd better be going i suppose serozhenka losing patience sergey began to scold the old man as if he were a little boy that's enough drivelling old man stupid who ever heard of people taking away other folks dogs in this way 
it's not the law what you blinking your eyes at me for is what i say untrue let us go simply and say give us back the dog and if they won't give it then to the courts with it and there's an end of it to the courts yes of course that's correct to the courts of course repeated ladishkin with a senseless bitter smile but his eyes looked hither and thither in confusion to the courts yes only you know serozhenka it wouldn't work we'd never get to the courts how not work the law is the same for everybody what have they got to say for themselves interrupted the boy impatiently now serozha don't do that don't be angry with me they won't give us back the dog at this point grandfather lowered his voice in a mysterious way i fear on account of the passport didn't you hear what the gentleman said up there have you a passport he says well and there you see i here grandfather made a wry and seemingly frightened face and whispered barely audibly i'm living with somebody else's passport serozha how somebody else's somebody else's there's no more about it i lost my own at taganrog perhaps somebody stole it for two years after that i wandered about hid myself gave bribes wrote petitions at last i saw there was no getting out of it i had to live like a hare afraid of everything but once in odessa in a night-house a greek remarked to me the following what you say says he is nonsense put twenty-five roubles on the table and i'll give you a passport that'll last you till doomsday i worried my brain about that i'll lose my head for this i thought however give it me said i and from that time my dear boy i've been going about the world with another man's passport ah grandfather grandfather sighed sergey with tears in his eyes i'm sorry about the dog it's a very fine dog you know serozhenka my darling cried the old man trembling if only i had a real passport do you think it would matter to me even if they were generals i'd take them by the throat how's this one minute if you please what right have you to steal other people's dogs what law is there for that but now there's a stopper on us serozha if i go to the police station the first thing will be show us your passport are you a citizen of samara by name martin lodishkin i your excellency dear me i little brother am not lodishkin at all and not a citizen but a peasant ivan dutkin is my name and who that lodishkin might be god only knows how can i tell perhaps a thief or an escaped convict perhaps even a murderer no serozha we shouldn't effect anything that way nothing at all grandfather choked and tears trickled once more over his sunburnt wrinkles sergey who had listened to the old man in silence his brows tightly knit his face pale with agitation suddenly stood up and cried come on grandfather to the devil with the passport i suppose we don't intend to spend the night here on the high road ah oh, my dear my darling said the old man trembling twas a clever dog that artoshenka of ours we shan't find such another all right all right get up cried sergey imperiously now let me knock the dust off you i feel quite worn out grandfather they worked no more that day despite his youthful years sergey well understood the fateful meaning of the dreadful word passport so he sought no longer to get arto back either through the courts or in any other decisive way and as he walked along the road with grandfather towards the inn where they should sleep his face took on a new obstinate concentrated expression as if he had just thought out something extraordinarily serious and great without actually expressing their intention the two wanderers made a considerable detour in order to pass once more by friendship villa and they stopped for a little while outside the gates in the vague hope of catching a glimpse of arto or of hearing his bark from afar but the iron gates of the magnificent villa were bolted and locked and an important undisturbed and solemn stillness reigned over the shady garden under the sad and mighty cypresses 
people cried the old man in a quavering voice putting into that one word all the burning grief that filled his heart ah that's enough come on cried the boy roughly pulling his companion by the sleeve serozhenka don't you think there's a chance that artoshenka might run away from them sighed the old man eh what do you think dear but the boy did not answer the old man he went ahead in firm large strides his eyes obstinately fixed on the road his brows obstinately frowning six they reached Alupka in silence grandfather muttered to himself and sighed the whole way sergey preserved in his face an angry and resolute expression they stopped for the night at a dirty turkish coffee-house bearing the splendid name of ildiz which means in turkish a star in the same room with them slept greek stone-breakers turkish ditch-diggers a gang of russian workmen and several dark-faced mysterious tramps the sort of which there are so many wandering about southern russia directly the coffee-house closed they stretched themselves out on the benches along the length of the walls or simply upon the floor and the more experienced placed their possessions and their clothes in a bundle under their heads it was long after midnight when sergey who had been lying side by side with grandfather on the floor got up stealthily and began to dress himself without noise throughout the wide window panes poured the full light of the moon falling on the floor to make a trembling carpet of silver and giving to the faces of the sleepers an expression of suffering and death where's you going to this time of night cried the owner of the coffee-house ibrahim a young turk lying at the door of the shop let me pass it's necessary i've got to go out answered sergey in a harsh business-like tone get up turco yawning and stretching himself ibrahim got up and opened the door clicking his tongue reproachfully the narrow streets of the tartar bazaar were enveloped in a dense dark blue mist which covered with a tooth-shaped design the whole cobbled roadway one side of the street lay in shade the other with all its white-clad houses was illumined by the moonlight dogs were barking at distant points of the village somewhere on the upper high road horses were trotting and the metallic clink of their hoofs sounded in the night stillness passing the white mosque with its green cupola surrounded by its grove of silent cypresses sergey tripped along a narrow crooked lane to the great highway in order that he might run quickly the boy was practically in his undergarments only the moon shone on him from behind and his shadow ran ahead in a strange foreshortened silhouette there were mysterious shaggy shrubs on each side of the road a bird was crying monotonously from the bushes in a gentle tender tone splew splew and it seemed as if it thought itself to be a sentry in the night silence guarding some melancholy secret and powerlessly struggling with sleep and tiredness complaining hopelessly quietly to some one splew splew i sleep i sleep and over the dark bushes over the blue headdress of the distant forests rose with its two peaks to the sky i petri so light so clear-cut so ethereal as if it were something cut from a gigantic piece of silver cardboard in the sky sergey felt a little depressed by the majestic silence in which his footsteps sounded so distinctly and daringly but at the same time there rose in his heart a sort of ticklish head wearing spirit of adventure at a turn of the road the sea suddenly opened before him immense and calm quietly and solemnly breaking on the shore from the horizon to the beach stretched a narrow a quivering silver roadway in the midst of the sea this roadway was lost and only here and there the traces of it glittered but suddenly nearer the shore it became a wide flood of living glimmering metal ornamenting the coast like a belt of deep lace sergey slipped noiselessly through the wooden gateway leading to the park there under the dense foliage of the trees it was quite dark from afar sounded the ceaseless murmur of mountain streams and one could feel their damp cold breath the wooden planks of the bridge clacked soundingly as he ran across the water beneath looked dark and dreadful in a moment he saw in front of him 
the high gates with their lace pattern of iron and the creeping gloxinia hanging over them the moonlight pouring from a gap in the trees outlined the lacework of the iron gates with as it were a gentle phosphorescence on the other side of the gates it was dark and there was a terrifying stillness sergey hesitated for some moments feeling in his soul some doubt even a little fear but he conquered his feelings and whispered obstinately to himself all the same i'm going to climb in all the same the elegant cast-iron design furnished solid stepping places and holding places for the muscular arms and feet of the climber but over the gateway at a considerable height and fitting to the gates was a broad archway of stone Sergey felt all over this with his hands, and climbed up on to it, lay on his stomach, and tried to let himself down on the other side. He hung by his hands, but could find no catching place for his feet. The stone archway stood out too far from the gate for his legs to reach, so he dangled there, and as he couldn't get back, his body grew limp and heavy, and terror possessed his soul. At last he could hold on no longer, his fingers gave, and he slipped and fell violently to the ground. He heard the gravel crunch under him, and felt a sharp pain in his knees. He lay crouching on all fours for some moments, stunned by the fall. He felt that in a minute out would come the gloomy-looking porter, raise a cry and make a fearful to-do. But the same brooding and self-important silence reigned in the garden as before. Only a sort of strange monotonous buzzing sounded everywhere about the villa and the estate. Zhu, 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 zhu. Ah, that's the noise in my ears, guessed Sergey. When he got on his feet again and looked round, all the garden had become dreadful and mysterious, and beautiful as in a fairy tale, a scented dream. On the flower beds, the flowers, barely visible in the darkness, leaned toward one another as if communicating a vague alarm the magnificent dark-scented cypresses nodded pensively and seemed to reflect reproachfully over all and beyond a little stream the tired little bird struggled with its desire to slumber and cried submissively and plaintively splew splew i sleep i sleep sergey could not recognize the place in the darkness for the confusion of the paths and the shadows he wandered for some time on the crunching gravel before he found the house. He had never in his whole life felt such complete helplessness and torturesome loneliness and desolation as he did now. The immense house felt as if it must be full of concealed enemies, watching him with wicked glee, peering at him from the dark windows. Every moment he expected to hear some sort of signal of wrathful fierce command only not in the house he couldn't possibly be in the house whispered the boy to himself as in a dream if they put him in the house he would begin to howl and they'd soon get tired of it he walked right around the house at the back in the wide yard were several outhouses more or less simple and capacious evidently designed for the accommodation of servants there was not a light in any of them and none in the great house itself only the moon saw itself darkly in the dull dead windows. "'I shan't ever get away from here, no, never,' thought Sergey to himself despairingly, and just for a moment his thoughts went back to the sleeping tavern and grandfather and the old organ, and to the place where they had slept in the afternoon, to their life on the road, and he whispered softly to himself, "'Never, never any more of that again.' and so thinking his fear changed to a sort of calm and despairing conviction but then suddenly he became aware of a faint far-off whimpering the boy stood still as if spellbound not daring to move the whimpering sound was repeated it seemed to come from the stone cellar near which sergey was standing and which was ventilated by a window with no glass just four rough square openings Stepping across a flower-bed, the boy went up to the wall, pressed his face to one of the openings, and whistled. He heard a slight cautious movement somewhere in the depths, and then all was silent. "'Arto! Artoshka!' cried Sergey in a trembling whisper. At this there burst out at once a frantic burst of barking, filling the whole garden and echoing from all sides. 
in this barking there was expressed not only joyful welcome but piteous complaint and rage and physical pain one could hear how the dog was tugging and pulling at something in the dark cellar trying to get free arto doggykin artoshenka repeated the boy in a sobbing voice peace cursed one ah you convict cried a brutal bass voice from below there was a sound of beating from the cellar the dog gave vent to a long howl don't dare to kill him kill the dog if you dare you villain cried sergey quite beside himself scratching the stone wall with his nails what happened after that sergey only remembered confusedly like something he had experienced in a dreadful nightmare the door of the cellar opened wide with a noise and out rushed the porter he was only in his pantaloons barefooted bearded pale from the bright light of the moon which was shining straight in his face to sergey he seemed like a giant or an enraged monster escaped from a fairy tale who goes there i shall shoot thieves robbers thundered the voice of the porter at that moment however there rushed from the door of the cellar out into the darkness arto with a broken cord hanging from his neck there was no question of the boy following the dog the sight of the porter filled him with supernatural terror tied his feet and seemed to paralyze his whole body fortunately this state of nerves didn't last long almost involuntarily sergey gave vent to a piercing and despairing shriek and he took to his heels at random not looking where he was going and absolutely forgetting himself from fear he went off like a bird his feet striking the ground as if they had suddenly become two steel springs and by his side ran arto joyfully and effusively barking after them came the porter heavily shouting and swearing at them as he went sergey was making for the gate but suddenly he had an intuition that there was no road for him that way along the white stone wall of the garden was a narrow track in the shelter of the cypress trees and sergey flung himself along this path obedient to the one feeling of fright the sharp needles of the cypress trees pregnant with the smell of pitch struck him in the face he fell over some roots and hurt his arm so that the blood came but jumped up at once not even noticing the pain and went on as fast as ever bent double and still followed by arto so he ran along this narrow corridor with the wall on one side and the closely ranged file of cypresses on the other ran as might a crazy little forest animal feeling himself in an endless trap his mouth grew dry his breathing was like needles in his breast yet all the time the noise of the following porter was audible and the boy losing his head ran back to the gate again and then once more up the narrow pathway and back again at last sergey ran himself tired instead of the wild terror he began to feel a cold deadly melancholy a tired indifference to danger he sat down under a tree and pressed his tired-out body to the trunk and closed his eyes nearer and nearer came the heavy steps of the enemy arto whimpered softly putting his nose between the boy's knees two steps from where sergey sat a big branch of a tree bent downward the boy, raising his eyes accidentally, was suddenly seized with joy, and jumped to his feet at a bound, for he noticed that at the place where he was sitting the wall was very low, not more than a yard and a half in height. The top was plastered with lime and broken bottle-glass, but Sergey did not give that a thought. In the twinkling of an eye he grabbed Arto by the body, and lifting him up, put him with his forelegs on the top of the wall. The clever poodle understood perfectly, clambered on to the top, wagged his tail, and barked triumphantly. Sergey followed him, making use of the branches of the cypress, and he had hardly got on to the top of the wall before he caught sight of a large, shadowy face. Two supple, agile bodies, the dogs and the boys, went quickly and softly to the bottom, on to the road, and following them, like a dirty stream, came the vile, malicious abuse of the porter but whether it was that the porter was less sure on his feet than our two friends or was tired with running round the garden or had simply given up hope of overtaking them he followed them no further nevertheless they ran on as fast as they could without resting strong light-footed as if the joy of deliverance had given them wings 
the poodle soon began to exhibit his accustomed frivolity. Sergei often looked back fearfully over his shoulders, but Arto leapt on him, wagging his ears ecstatically and waving the bit of cord that was hanging from his neck, actually licking Sergei's face with his long tongue. The boy became calm only by the time they got to the spring, where the afternoon before grandfather and he had made their lunch. There both the boy and the dog put their lips to the cold stream, and drank long and eagerly of the fresh and pleasant water. They got in one another's way with their heads, and thinking they had quenched their thirst, yet returned to the basin to drink more, and would not stop. When at last they got away from the spot the water rolled about in their over-full insides as they ran. The danger passed, all the terrors of the night explored, they felt gay now, and light-hearted, going along the white road, brightly lit up by the moon, going through the dark shrubs, now wet with morning dew, and exhaling the sweet scent of freshened leaves. At the door of the coffee-house, Ildiz Ibrahim met the boy and whispered reproachfully, "'Where you been a-roving, boy? Where you been? No, 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 that's not good!' Sergei did not wish to wake grandfather, but Arto did it for him. He at once found the old man in the midst of the other people, sleeping on the floor, and quite forgetting himself, licked him all over his cheeks and eyes and nose and mouth, yelping joyfully. Grandfather awoke, saw the broken cord hanging from the poodle's neck, saw the boy lying beside him, covered with dust, and understood all. He asked Sergei to explain, but got no answer. The little boy was asleep, his arms spread out on the floor, his mouth wide open. End of story nine. Story ten of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE ELEPHANT 1. The little girl was unwell. Every day the doctor came to see her, Dr. Michael Petrovitch, whom she had known long, long ago. And sometimes he brought with him two other doctors whom she didn't know. They turned the little girl over onto her back, and then onto her stomach, listening to something, putting an ear against her body, pulled down her under eyelids, and looked at them. They seemed very important people, they had stern faces, and they spoke to one another in a language the little girl did not understand. Afterwards they went out from the nursery into the drawing-room, where mother sat waiting for them. The most important doctor, the tall one with grey hair and gold eyeglasses, talked earnestly to her for a long time. The door was not shut, and the little girl lying on her bed could see and hear all. There was much that she didn't understand, but she knew the talk was about her. Mother looked up at the doctor with large, tired, tear-filled eyes. When the doctors went away, the chief one said loudly, "'The most important thing, don't let her be dull. Give in to all her whims.' "'Ah, doctor, but she doesn't want anything.' "'Well, I know. Think what she used to like before she was ill. Toys, something nice to eat.' no no doctor she doesn't want anything well try and tempt her with something no matter what it is i give you my word that if you can only make her laugh and enjoy herself it would be better than any medicine you must understand that your daughter's illness is indifference to life and nothing more good morning madam two dear nadya my dear little girl said mother isn't there anything you would like to have? No, mother, I don't want anything. Wouldn't you like me to put out all your dolls on the bed? We'll arrange the easy chair, the sofa, the little table, and put the tea service out. The dolls shall have tea and talk to one another about the weather and their children's health. Thank you, mother, I don't want it. It's so dull. Oh, very well, little girlie, we won't have the dolls. Suppose we ask Katya or Zhenochka to come and see you. You're very fond of them. I don't want them, mother. Indeed, I don't. I don't want anything. Don't want anything. I'm so dull. Shall I get you some chocolate? 
But the little girl didn't answer. She lay and stared at the ceiling with steadfast, mournful eyes. She had no pain at all. She wasn't even feverish. But she was getting thinner and weaker every day. She didn't mind what was done to her. It made no difference. She didn't care for anything. She lay like this all day, and all night, quiet, mournful. Sometimes she would doze for half an hour, and then in her dreams she would see something long and grey and dull, as if she were looking at rain in autumn. When the door leading from the nursery into the drawing-room was open, and the other door into the study was open, too, the little girl could see her father. Father would walk swiftly from one corner of the room to the other, and all the time he would smoke, smoke. Sometimes he would come into the nursery, and sit on the edge of Nadia's bed, and stroke her feet gently. Then he would get up suddenly and go to the window, whistle a little, and look out into the street. But his shoulders would tremble. He would hurriedly press his handkerchief first to one eye and then to the other, and then go back into his study as if he were angry. Then he would begin again to pace up and down and smoke, and smoke, and smoke. And his study would look all blue from the clouds of tobacco smoke. 3. One morning the little girl woke to feel a little stronger than usual. She had dreamed something, but she couldn't remember exactly what she had dreamed, and she looked attentively into her mother's eyes for a long time. "'What would you like?' asked mother. But the little girl had suddenly remembered her dream, and she said in a whisper, as if it were a secret, "'Mother, could I have an elephant? Only not one that's painted in a picture, eh?' "'Of course you can, my child, of course.' She went into the study and told Papa that the little girl wanted an elephant. Papa put on his coat and hat directly, and went off somewhere. In half an hour he came back, bringing with him an expensive, beautiful toy. It was a large grey elephant that could move its head and wave its tail. On its back was a red saddle, and on the saddle there was a golden vent with three little men sitting inside but the little girl paid no attention to the toy. She only looked up at the walls and ceiling, and said languidly, "'No, that's not at all what I meant. I wanted a real live elephant, and this one's dead.' "'But only look at it, Nadja," said Mama. "'We'll wind him up, and he'll be exactly, exactly like a live one.' The elephant was wound up with a key, and it then began to move its legs and walk slowly along the table, nodding its head and waving its tail. But the little girl wasn't interested at all. She was even bored by it, though in order that her father shouldn't feel hurt, she whispered kindly, "'Thank you very much, dear Papa. I don't think anyone has such an interesting toy as this. Only, you remember, long ago, you promised to take me to a menagerie to see a real elephant, and you didn't bring it here.' "'But listen, my dear child, don't you understand that that's impossible? An elephant is very big, he's as high as the ceiling, and we couldn't get him into our rooms. And what's more, where could I obtain one?' "'Papa, I don't want such a big one. You could bring me as little a one as you like, so long as it's alive. As big as this, a baby elephant.' "'My dear child, I should be glad to do anything for you. But this is impossible. It's just as if you suddenly said to me, Papa, get me the sun out of the sky. The little girl smiled sadly. How stupid you are, Papa! As if I didn't know it's impossible to get the sun, it's all on fire. And the moon, too, you can't get. No, if only I had a little elephant, a real one. And she quietly closed her eyes and whispered, I'm tired. Forgive me, Papa." Papa clutched at his hair and ran away to his study, where for some time he marched up and down. Then he resolutely threw his unfinished cigarette on the floor — Mama was always grumbling at him about this — and called out to the maid, "'Olga, bring me my hat and coat!' His wife came out into the hall. "'Where are you going, Sasha?' asked she. He breathed heavily as he buttoned up his coat. "'I don't know myself, Mashenka, where I'm going. 
Only I think that this evening I shall actually bring a live elephant here. His wife looked anxiously at him. My dear, are you quite well? said she. Haven't you got a headache? Perhaps you slept badly last night. I didn't sleep at all, he answered angrily. I see, you want to ask if I'm going out of my mind. Not just yet. Good-bye, you'll see this evening. And he went off, loudly slamming the front door after him. 4. In two hours' time he was seated in the front row at the menagerie, and watching trained animals perform their different parts under the direction of the manager. Clever dogs jumped, turned somersaults, danced, sang to music, made words with large cardboard letters. Monkeys, one in a red skirt, the other in blue knickers, walked the tightrope and rode upon a large poodle. An immense tawny lion jumped through burning hoops. A clumsy seal fired a pistol, and at last they brought out the elephants. There were three of them, one large and two quite small ones, dwarfs, but all the same much larger than a horse. It was strange to see how these enormous animals, apparently so heavy and awkward, could perform the most difficult tricks which would be out of the power of a very skilful man. The largest elephant distinguished himself particularly. He stood up at first on his hind legs, then sat down, then stood on his head with his feet in the air, walked along wooden bottles, then on a rolling cask, turned over the pages of a large picture-book with his tail, and, finally, sat down at a table, and, tying a serviette around his neck, had his dinner just like a well-brought-up little boy. The show came to an end. The spectators went out. Nadja's father went up to the stout German, the manager of the menagerie. He was standing behind a partition, smoking a long black cigar. "'Pardon me, please,' said Nadja's father. "'Would it be possible for you to send your elephant to my house for a short time?' The German's eyes opened wide in astonishment, and his mouth also, so that the cigar fell to the ground. He made an exclamation, bent down, picked up the cigar, put it in his mouth again, and then said, "'Send? The elephant? To your house? I don't understand you.' It was evident from his look that he also wanted to ask Nadja's father if he were a little wrong in the head, but the father quickly began to explain the matter. His only daughter, Nadia, was ill with a strange malady which no doctor could understand or cure. She had lain for a month in her bed, had grown thinner and weaker every day, wasn't interested in anything, was only dull. She seemed to be slowly dying. The doctors had said she must be roused, but she didn't care for anything. They had said that all her desires were to be gratified, but she didn't wish for anything at all. Today she had said she wanted to see a live elephant. Wasn't it possible to manage that she should? And he took the German by the button of his coat, and added in a trembling voice, Well, of course I hope that my little girl will get well again. But suppose, God forbid it, her illness should take a sudden turn for the worse, and she should die. Just think, shouldn't I be tortured for all the rest of my life to think that I hadn't fulfilled her last her very last wish?" The German wrinkled up his forehead, and thoughtfully scratched his left eyebrow with his little finger. At length he asked, "'Hm, how old is your little girl?' Six. "'Hm, my Lisa's six, too. Hm, but you know, it'll cost you a lot. We'll have to take the elephant one night, and we can't bring it back till the next night. It'll be impossible to do it in the daytime. There'd be such crowds of people, and such a fuss. It means that I should lose a whole day, and you ought to pay me for it. Of course, of course, don't be anxious about that. And then, will the police allow an elephant to be taken into a private house? I'll arrange it. They'll allow it. And there's another question. Will the landlord of your house allow the elephant to come in? Yes, I'm my own landlord. Aha! That's all the better. And still another question. What floor do you live on? The second. Hm. That's not so good. Have you a broad staircase, a high ceiling, a large room, wide doorways, and a very stout flooring? 
because my tommy is three and a quarter arshins in height and five and a half long and he weighs a hundred and twelve poods an arshin is about three quarters of a yard and a pood is thirty-six pounds nadja's father thought for a moment do you know what said he you come with me and look at the place if it's necessary i'll have a wider entrance made very good agreed the manager of the menagerie five that night they brought the elephant to visit the sick girl he marched importantly down the very middle of the street nodding his head and curling up and uncurling his trunk a great crowd of people came with him in spite of the late hour but the elephant paid no attention to the people. He saw hundreds of them every day in the menagerie. Only once did he get a little angry. A street urchin ran up to him under his very legs and began to make grimaces for the diversion of the sightseers. Then the elephant quietly took off the boy's cap with his trunk and threw it over a wall nearby, which was protected at the top by projecting nails. A policeman came up to the people and tried to persuade them. "'Gentlemen, I beg you to go away. What's there here unusual? I'm astonished at you, as if you never saw an elephant in the street before.' They came up to the house. On the staircase and all the way up to the dining-room, where the elephant was to go, every door was opened wide. The latches had all been pushed down with a hammer. It was just the same as had been done once when they brought a large wonder-working icon into the house. But when he came to the staircase the elephant stopped in alarm and refused to go in. "'You must get him something dainty to eat,' said the German. "'A sweet cake or something. But Tommy! Oh, ho, ho, ho! Tommy!' Nadja's father ran off to a neighbouring confectioner's and bought a large round pistachio tart. The elephant looked as if he would like to eat it at one gulp, and the cardboard box it was in as well, but the German gave him only a quarter of the tart. Tommy evidently liked it, and stretched out his trunk for a second morsel. But the German was cunning. Holding the tart in his hand, he went up the staircase, step by step, and the elephant unwillingly followed him, with outstretched trunk and bristling ears. On the landing Tommy was given a second piece. In this way they brought him into the dining-room, from whence all the furniture had been taken out beforehand, and the floor had been strewn with a thick layer of straw. Tommy was fastened by the leg to a ring which had been screwed into the floor. They put some fresh carrots, cabbages, and turnips in front of him. The German stretched himself out on a sofa by Tommy's side. The lights were put out, and everybody went to bed. 6. Next morning the little girl woke very early, and asked first thing, "'The elephant, has he come?' "'Yes, he's come,' said Mama. "'But he says that Nadja must first of all be washed, and then eat a soft-boiled egg, and drink some hot milk.' "'Is he good?' "'Yes, he's good. Eat it up, dear. We'll go and see him in a minute.' "'Is he funny?' "'Yes, a little. Put on your warm bodice.' The egg was quickly eaten, and the milk drunk. Nadia was put in the perambulator, in which she used to be taken out when she was too small to walk by herself, and wheeled into the dining-room. The elephant looked much larger than Nadia had thought when she saw it in a picture. He was only just a little lower than the top of the door, and half as long as the dining-room. He had thick skin, in heavy folds. His legs were thick as pillars. His long tail looked something like a broom at the end. His head had great lumps on it. His ears were as large as shovels, and were hanging down. His eyes were quite tiny, but they looked wise and kind. His tusks had been cut off. His trunk was like a long snake, and had two nostrils at the end, with a moving flexible finger between them. If the elephant had stretched out his trunk to its full length, it would probably have reached to the window. The little girl was not at all frightened. She was only just a little astounded by the enormous size of the animal. But Polya, the sixteen-year-old nursemaid, began to whimper in terror. The elephant's master, the German, came up to the perambulator and said, "'Good morning, young lady. Don't be afraid, please. Tommy's very good, and he likes children.' 
The little girl held out her little white hand to the German. "'Good morning,' she said in answer. "'How are you? I'm not in the least afraid. What's his name?' "'Tommy.' "'Good morning, Tommy,' said the child, with a bow. "'How did you sleep last night?' She held out her hand to him. The elephant took it cautiously, and pressed her thin fingers with his movable strong one, and he did this much more gently than Dr. Michael Petrovitch. Then he nodded his head, and screwed up his little eyes as if he were laughing. "'Does he understand everything?' asked the little girl of the German. "'Oh, absolutely everything, miss.' "'Only he can't speak.' "'No, he can't speak. Do you know? I've got a little girl just as small as you. Her name's Lisa. Tommy's a great, a very great friend of hers.' "'And you, Tommy? Have you had any tea yet?' asked Nadia. The elephant stretched out his trunk and blew out a warm breath into the little girl's face, making her hair puff out at each side. Nadia laughed and clapped her hands. The German laughed out loud, too. He was also large and fat, and good-natured, like the elephant, and Nadia thought they looked like one another. Perhaps they were relations. "'No, he hasn't had tea, miss, but he likes to drink sugar-water, and he's very fond of rolls.' Some rolls were brought in on a tray. The little girl handed some to her guest. He caught a roll cleverly with his finger, and, turning up his trunk into a ring, hid the roll somewhere underneath his head, where one could see his funny three-cornered, hairy, lower lip moving, and hear the roll rustling against the dry skin. Tommy did the same with a second roll, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, nodding his head and wrinkling up his little eyes still more with satisfaction. And the little girl laughed delightedly. When the rolls were all eaten, Nadia presented her dolls to the elephant. "'Look, Tommy, this nicely dressed doll is Sonia. She's a very good child, but a little naughty sometimes, and doesn't want to eat her soup. This one is Natasha, Sonia's daughter. She's begun to learn already, and she knows almost all her letters. And this one is Matryoshka. She was my very first doll. Look, she hasn't got any nose, and her head's been stuck on, and she's lost all her hair. But I can't turn an old woman out of the house, can I, Tommy? She used to be Sonia's mother, but now she's the cook. Let's have a game, Tommy. You be the father, and I'll be the mother, and these shall be our children. Tommy agreed. He laughed, took Matryoshka by the neck, and put her in his mouth. But this was only a joke. After biting the doll a little, he put her back again on the little girl's lap, just a little wet and crumpled. Then Nadia showed him a large picture-book, and explained, "'This is a horse. This is a canary. This is a gun. Look, there's a cage with a bird inside. Here's a pail, a looking-glass, a stove, a spade, a raven. And here, just look, here's an elephant. It's not at all like you, is it?' Is it possible an elephant could be so small, Tommy?" Tommy thought that there were no elephants in the world as small as that. He didn't seem to like that picture. He took hold of the edge of the page with his finger, and turned it over. It was dinner-time now, but the little girl couldn't tear herself away from the elephant. The German came to the rescue. "'If you will allow me, I will arrange it all. They can dine together.' He ordered the elephant to sit down, and the obedient animal did so, shaking all the floor of the whole flat, making all the china on the sideboard jingle, and the people downstairs were sprinkled over with bits of plaster falling from the ceiling. The little girl sat opposite the elephant. The table was put between them. A tablecloth was tied round the elephant's neck, and the new friends began their dinner. The little girl had chicken broth and cutlets, the elephant had various vegetables and salad. The little girl had a liqueur glass full of sherry, and the elephant had some warm water with a glass full of rum in it, and he sucked up this liquid through his trunk with great pleasure from a soup tureen. Then they had the sweet course, the little girl a cup of cocoa, and the elephant a tart, a walnut one this time. The German, meanwhile, sat with Papa in the drawing-room, and, with as much pleasure as the elephant, 
drank beer, only in greater quantities. After dinner some visitors came to see Papa, and they were warned in the hall about the elephant so that they should not be frightened. At first they couldn't believe it, but when they saw Tommy they pressed themselves close up against the door. "'Don't be afraid. He's good,' said the little girl soothingly. But the visitors quickly hurried into the drawing-room, and after having sat there for five minutes, took their departure. The evening came. It grew late, and time for the little girl to go to bed. But they couldn't get her away from the elephant. She dropped asleep by his side presently, and then they carried her off to the nursery. She didn't wake up, even when she was being undressed. That night Nadia dreamed that she was married to Tommy, and that they had many children, tiny, jolly little baby elephants. The elephant, whom they took back at night to the menagerie, also dreamed of the sweet and affectionate little girl. He dreamt, too, that he had a large tart with walnuts and pistachios as big as a gate. Next morning the little girl woke, fresh and healthy, and, as she used to do before her illness, cried out, in a voice to be heard all over the house, loudly and impatiently, "'I want some milk!' Hearing this cry, in her bedroom Mamma crossed herself devoutly. But the little girl remembered what had happened yesterday, and she asked, "'Where's the elephant?' They explained to her that the elephant had been obliged to go home, that he had children who couldn't be left by themselves, and that he had left a message for Nadia to say that he hoped she would come and see him as soon as she was well. The little girl smiled slyly and said, "'Tell Tommy that I'm quite well now.'" End of Story 10